What's going on, everyone? I'm Anthony Fava, and welcome to episode two of Film Time with Fava, brought to you by Fired Up Network. I hope you're all doing good at home. Now let's get into it. So this week, I'm going to be doing my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Now, this is not what I think are the 10 best movies ever made. These are just my personal opinion on what my top 10 favorite movies are. But before we get into that, I do want to talk about one thing. So lately, I've been making it my mission to go through the top 100 list of movies on IMDb. And, uh, well, I shouldn't say I've been making it my mission to because so far I've only watched one. But the one I have watched was number 100. And that was the German film M, which is known as one of the first serial killer movies. And this is directed by Fritz Lang. And I gotta be honest, usually I'm not into these older movies. This one was from 1931. I kind of liked it. I watched a video on it after to give me just a bit more context on it. And yeah, this movie was actually very good. It's not in my top 10. But it was very good and is making me a bit more happy to be watching these older movies that are coming up in the IMDb Top 100 because a lot of them are older movies. Now, let's get into my top 10. But first, if you're not following me on social media, make sure you do that now. Instagram at Favalicious and Twitter at A underscore Fav24. Follow me there for updates on the show, on my life, on everything. Talk to me. Give me some suggestions for things you want to see in the future. Guests you maybe want to have on within reason, obviously. We're not going to be having Leonardo DiCaprio on the show anytime soon. But yeah, now let's get into my top 10. Now, before I get into the actual top 10, I do want to go over some honorable mentions. So for my first honorable mention, we have WALL-E. Now, this is my favorite Pixar movie, but it doesn't quite make it in the top 10. I actually only watched this movie recently this year because up until then, um, The Good Dinosaur of all movies was my favorite Pixar movie. And Wall-E just blew it out of the water. This movie was great. Uh, I would say the cinematography was great, but it's an animated movie. But a lot of the animated shots were amazing. Like the one where Wall-E's flying with his little fire extinguisher outside the space station. It was just a very well animated movie with an amazing story. Yeah, so the next one, not animated, is The Karate Kid. Now, this was close to cracking my top 10, but in the end, it just isn't quite as good as the movies that did make it. Now, The Karate Kid is a movie that I've loved for a long time. Um, I've watched it so many times, and I think if we were talking about franchises as a whole, The Karate Kid franchise would probably be in there if you combine the original Karate Kid um, I, th- I believe there's Karate Kid 1, 2, 3, and then there's the next Karate Kid. And then if you also then combine Cobra Kai, which is one of my favorite shows out right now, that show is amazing. I think then that would crack a top 10 of franchises. Maybe I'll do that in the future. But for now, Cobra, yeah, not Cobra Kai, the Karate Kid is just getting an honorable mention here. Uh, my third honorable mention, there's five, by the way. Um, the next one is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Now, this is more of a I shouldn't say a feel good. It's a feel good for the most part, but it does take some dark turns. Um, Yeah, so The Perks of Being a Wallflower, awesome movie, coming of age. Paul Rudd is actually very good in this movie in a more serious role as um, Logan Lerman's English teacher. But yeah, it just shows the troubles of being someone who is afraid to break out of their shell, especially in the teenage years of someone's life and I think it's something that a lot of people who just experience shyness or anxiety in general can relate to um the next one is kind of a double here so these two movies would have been in my top 10 if it was just strictly based on the enjoyment level I had in theaters and the suspense leading up to these movies in theaters um, and these two movies are Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. I don't think I've ever seen a duo of movies that just got me more hyped and in such suspense than these. I've been watching the MCU since the beginning. So this was just a great like bookend to that chapter. After I saw Infinity War in theaters, not going to lie, Spider-Man is my favorite superhero. I was floored by that ending with everyone just getting dusted and then To come back one year later, it felt like tradition at that point, come back a year later for the ending of it. Uh, Yeah, the ending, 
I wouldn't say Endgame is quite as good as Infinity War, but it was definitely a great payoff and a great bookend to the MCU as a whole. And I'm looking forward to see what they're doing in the future now with uh, WandaVision, Loki, uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, etc. And my fifth spot, now this one, straight from the heart. You see the basketball jersey in the back. I got the Michael Jordan poster over there. You can't see it. But uh, yeah. The, my fifth honorable mention has to go to Space Jam. Once again, if this list was strictly based off of nostalgia, enjoyment, Space Jam might be number one. I've seen that movie probably over 100 times. Might be a bit of an exaggeration, but that just shows how much I really enjoy watching this movie. Is it the best movie from a cinema standpoint, from a filmmaking standpoint? Not at all. Is it fun as hell to watch? Yes. I love Space Jam. I always will love Space Jam. And that's why I get an honorable mention, but I'm not going to put it in my top 10. But now that brings us to my top 10. And at number 10, this may be surprising. I Also, keep in mind, um, if the film is from a film franchise, I'm only going to be using one of those films on the list. So I'll, I'll give an example of... of one that's spoiler alert, not going to be my top 10. Say I was doing the Conjuring franchise, I would only put one of those Conjuring movies on the list, even though, even if I liked one of them and another one enough to put it on at maybe a lower spot. So I'm putting my favorite one from the franchise on this list. And with that, at number 10, we have Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, directed by Steven Spielberg, and this came out in 1984. Now, when most people think of their favorite Indiana Jones movie, they immediately think of the first one, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's a classic. Can't mess with it. But me personally, Temple of Doom is just my favorite. Uh, Raiders comes close, but Temple of Doom just does something for me that none of the other ones do. So for those who don't know, Essentially, Temple of Doom was the second Indiana Jones movie to come out, but it was a prequel to the first one. And unlike the first and third Indiana Jones movies, this one didn't focus on the usual arc of Indiana Jones trying to find some ancient relic and defeat the Nazis. This one was a fresh adventure. Um, He goes to this ancient temple out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, he basically has to get these three stones that this like torturous cult religion is using to try and overthrow the world. Now this may sound ridiculous, but this movie is so fun to watch. And some of the shots are amazing of the, um, of the temple. And when the guy gets his heart ripped out of his chest, I remember as a kid watching that and just being so scared. But yeah, I came back to this movie. Um, I think in 2019 or 2020 and I just, it brought back so many memories and even after watching the other indiana jones movies including kingdom of the crystal skull why does that exist uh, after watching those i still to this day will always go for temple of doom first and that is why it comes in at number 10 now at number nine we have spider-man into the spider-verse from 2018 now i was thinking of putting spider-man 2 at this spot because that is my favorite of the live-action Spider-Man movies. Spoiler alert, I like those ones better than what we've seen from the MCU Spider-Man movies thus far. Uh, Far From Home was close. But I had to give it to Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I know it's animated, but it's just the best Spider-Man movie to date. Um, The animation style, oh my god, it's incredible. So it looks like it's from a comic, but it's also a mix of 3D. And the frame rate is a bit choppy but it just gives this great look to the movie and i believe it also gets smoother as the movie goes on to represent the main character miles morales uh, to represent his growth over time and the music oh my god the soundtrack in this movie post malone sway lee juice world just so many good moments in this movie um the acting of course um standouts for me are John Mulaney as Spider-Ham and Nicolas Cage as Spider-Man Noir. They just they just put the cherry on top of this already amazing movie. You didn't need them in there, but they just add that little chef's kiss to this movie. 
And that is why Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is in at number nine. Now, number eight is a movie that maybe a lot of people haven't heard of, and it's Opening Night from 1977. Now, I hadn't actually watched this movie until, I believe, last summer in 2020. And honestly, I'm glad I ended up watching it. I saw it on Letterboxd, and it was in a recommended list. And I, it was a more obscure title. It's uh, directed by John Cassavetes and starring Gina Rowlands as the lead character. And it's basically about this lady who is an older actress trying to make her comeback in a Broadway show. And she's just dealing with her demons, and which is alcoholism for the most part. And it starts off where she, her limousine runs over this girl who had asked for her autograph earlier. And then the rest of the movie, she's haunted by this ghost. But the symbolism there is that you don't know whether it's the ghost of this girl or her past self and demons represented through this ghostly figure. And it's honestly just a beautiful movie to watch. Um, It mostly takes place on a stage with um yeah just shots of the play itself happening showing how her demons and emotions come out through that play that she's doing yeah and it's really just a beautiful movie to watch highly recommend opening night if you haven't seen it uh number seven this should come as no surprise that this is in my top 10 this is a well-known excellent movie and it is 2001 a space odyssey from 1968 directed by the amazing director stanley kubrick famous for Clockwork Orange, and of course, The Shining, starring Jack Nicholson. Uh, This movie is just incredible. This came out in 1968, and some of the set pieces and things that it shows, it, like, oh my god. The HAL, the, the, you may know, it's the operating system of the spaceship that becomes evil and gets like a mind of its own kind of thing. That thing is literally the AI that we're seeing today being built. Um, Don't be surprised if that rises against us. Just like this HAL thing rose up against the astronauts in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, I'm so glad my friends recommended this movie to me. I had heard about it, but it wasn't until a couple years ago that I finally watched it. And some of the shots in this movie are incredible. One in particular, me and my friends always talk about because we don't know how it was shot. So there's this guy running around the spaceship, but he's running around in such a way that he's like defying gravity. It's kind of like this, if you're watching this on video. Yeah, big circle like that. But the camera stays in one spot as he just runs all the way around. Like it doesn't follow him. So the camera can't be on an angle. So unless this guy has like Velcro or magnets on his feet, I don't really know what was going on there. But this movie is just incredible. The shots in this movie, the beginning part was, is, I think is criminally underrated where it shows the first instance of just brutality towards animals and animals when it shows the apes and just showing how we've evolved from that. Um, the rest of the movie is nothing to scoff at either, obviously. I mean, it's a masterpiece. It speaks for itself. 2001 A Space Odyssey in at number seven. Uh, number six, this is a movie I discovered, I rediscovered this year. I had seen it when I was very young, but I hadn't really paid attention that much until now. And that is an animated movie, The Prince of Egypt from 1998. Now, I was raised Catholic. So I always sort of knew the story of Moses. But honestly, in church, I was always just kind of didn't want to be there. But I saw a video about this movie. And I thought, maybe I should give it another chance. So I did. And I am so glad I did because it is now my favorite animated movie. Yeah, I know, right? A story about the Bible. I would have never thought. But the Bible in itself is, even if you don't believe in the events that happen in the Bible, the stories in there, some of them are just incredible. And this, especially the Exodus story that is represented in this movie, Um, Moses freeing the slaves from Egypt, parting the Red Sea. That scene in this movie is incredible where you see the sea parting. It is just so beautiful to watch. The story is amazing. Um, The the cast of this movie. Val Kilmer as Moses. Sandra Bullock as his sister. uh, Jeff Goldblum as his brother Aaron. Um, I'm definitely Ray Fiennes as Ramses. 
Uh, Patrick Stewart as the Pharaoh. Oh my God. And I'm not even listing all of them. This movie is just incredible. It is, if you haven't watched The Prince of Egypt, don't be hesitant because of its religious basis. The Exodus story is just very good and it has never been done better than in this movie. I've seen the Ten Commandments. This is far better. Sorry, Charlton Heston. Um, so yeah, next up after the Prince of Egypt, another, oh, this next one, very good. Ex Machina from 2014, directed by Alex Garland. So my program in school is media information and technoculture. And one of the things we talk about a lot is AI systems and how media is taking over our lives. And we are essentially just pawns in the game being controlled, but we don't realize that because we're just in this environment where we're led to believe that we have control, but we really don't. And with that, Ex Machina is about an AI come to life. It's almost a Google-esque um, kind of business where the head of the business invites just a worker over to see some of his new experiments, discoveries, and what he shows him is an AI that has a human form. It's essentially a humanoid robot and he starts to fall in love with it. And seeing what unfolds from that is honestly so incredible. I, after watching that, I'm convinced that Google is making the next Ava. That's what the robot's called in the movie. Uh, I say robot, but it's, she's really so much more than that in this. And yeah, just, oh, there's one quote in this movie that really stuck with me. It's, it's something along the lines of when you have made a machine that has consciousness that's not the history of man that's the history of the gods yeah so really just there's a lot of uh religious imagery in this of like man making living things and stuff like that and just the weakness of man is really shown in this compared to their ai counterparts and it's just so beautifully shot the soundtrack is awesome uh there's one in particular i think it's called one song on their bunsen burner um, I was writing a script about an AI uh, about a year ago, and I listened to that while I was writing, and it really got me in the mood because I was just in that ex machina technological thriller mindset. So yeah, ex machina. If you haven't seen it, honestly, you can watch it with like some substances too. I don't condone that. Um, anyways, next up, number four, one of the greatest movies of all time, according to many. And according to me, uh, the original Godfather from 1972, directed, of course, by Francis Ford Coppola. Um, I'm not just saying this because I'm Italian and because this movie is one of the most Italian things I've ever seen, but this film is incredible. You get to see a guy evolve from a war veteran, just your average. He's a nice guy. He doesn't want to be in this family business. But then once he gets that taste at the beginning and kills the one guy. You see Michael Corleone evolve from this friendly guy into this hardened mob boss by the end. And seeing that journey is really something, uh, totally apart from the great performances by um, Al Pacino and by Marlon Brando, just to name two. Yeah, even with, besides those performances, like the cinematography is incredible. That ending scene, oh my God, where he had just talked to Diane Keaton's character and told her, oh yeah, no, like that was my last mob hit, whatever. And he's just on the outside of that door that's about to close and all the guys in the mob are just like, go the father, go the father. And she, and you can see her eyes, she knows, yeah, this ain't over. And she's right, because there's two more movies. Um, but no, The Godfather is a movie that is just, oh, so good to watch. I could watch it over and over, and that is why it is in at number four. Now, number three also has that Italian connection like The Godfather, but this one is one that I've been watching for years. It's one of the most famous sports movies of all time, but it's also a lot more than just a sports movie it's a real character movie and that is rocky from 1976 directed by sylvester stallone and others i honestly don't know the other directors but the movie is based on the book rocky by sylvester stallone it follows a down and out old oldish boxer rocky balboa 
as he gets the opportunity of a lifetime, he gets to fight the heavyweight champion of the world on a fluke too, because Apollo Creed, the heavyweight champion, his former opponent couldn't fight him anymore. So they went looking for someone and they found the Italian stallion, Rocky Balboa. That's also my nickname in case you didn't know. Um, yeah, no, this is just a great underdog story. Never seen an underdog story done so well as in Rocky. Um, Stallone, I don't he is it rude to say that he acts as like a an intelligent man very well i don't know but he's been playing the rocky character for so long now and none better than in the first one. Oh my god and spoiler alert at the end rocky doesn't even win but you still feel as if he succeeded and even without the rest of the movies in this rocky franchise oh by the way this is one of those times where um I could have easily put other movies because the Creed series of movies that has two movies so far, both of those are some of my favorite sports movies and they are right up there with uh, the Rocky films in my opinion. Um, But as I was saying, even if you remove all the other Rocky movies and just have this one standalone title, it would be perfect. It's incredible to watch. It really is. Just seeing this guy come from nothing. It's like the slogan goes his whole life was a million to one shot and i think it really shows the um the notion that you can really do anything you put your mind to and even if you may not have the tools at the time or you no one believes in you you believe in yourself and you know that you can do great things and that is why rocky comes in at number three now we are into our top two now these two I was very close to putting the number two with the number one, but the number one just does so much for me and is so, I've been watching it for so long. So I had to give number one its spot, but that should not take away from the greatness that is number two. And number two is one of my, I shouldn't say, I don't even have to say it's one of my favorite movies. Is that number two? Number two is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind from 2004, directed by Michel Gondry, starring jim carrey primarily known as a comedic actor but in this he really flexes his serious more dramatic muscles um yeah this movie is incredible this is the movie i recommend if you're ever going through literally any bad situation in life especially a breakup this movie is awesome it follows the story of um jim Car- jim carrey's character joel joel barish as he breaks up he went through a rough breakup with his girlfriend played by Titanic. Titanic. Why am I forget? Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet. I'll never let go. Yeah, well, you did. Um, yeah, he breaks up with Kate Winslet. Uh, he's handling it very badly, and Kate Winslet actually gets a procedure done to get him erased from her memory. Um, and then after that happens, he really just goes off and eventually decides that he wants that procedure as well because he doesn't want to live in a world without her essentially and the whole movie is him inside his own head as they're doing the procedure where they take away the memories because he's asleep in his own home during the procedure and it's just him going through all these memories of him and clementine played by kate winslet who is his ex-girlfriend and he's just going through all these memories and realizing that he wanted to keep those memories and he's trying to keep them as they're getting erased and it's it's honestly very sad to watch but at the same time just it's so beautiful um there's a quote by alfred lord tennyson and it is it is better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all and i think that is just embodied through this movie Because you realize that going through that hurt and losing someone you care about so much, it hurts when it happens, but if you give it time, you'll realize that it was for the best and that those memories that you'll have forever, the good ones, even the bad ones, they'll help you and they're just good memories to have. And yeah, through this, yeah, this movie's gone me through a lot of hard times, a lot of breakups. I shouldn't say a lot of breakups. 
uh, a few breakups. And yeah, it's the shots in this movie. Oh my God. One of them, the most famous one where they're on the ice and right next to him is the giant crack just representing the fracturing of his mind is just, that scene is amazing. The rest of the movie is amazing. Uh, Jim Carrey, oh my God, this is definitely his best movie in my opinion. And a lot of people rank it as his best movie and for a reason. It's just that incredible. Yeah, honestly, I could talk about this movie all day, but I really need to get to number one. Um, yeah, so that's why Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind comes in at number two. Uh, so number one this may surprise some people but I have loved this franchise since I was I believe nine or ten and essentially how I got into this was I was at my grandma's house and my uncle had a VHS tape of this movie and I randomly just wanted to borrow it it's an obscure no I shouldn't say obscure it's a strange movie but I borrowed the VHS tape, brought it back to Mississauga from North Bay, where he lives, and I watched the movie, and I was hooked. And that movie was the 1968 classic, Planet of the Apes. I know, that's my favorite movie, and it I think it always will be, just because of the... That's the one... Like, with Space Jam, it's one of my favorite movies, but I know it's not a good movie. But with this one... It has the nostalgic value. It's fun to watch. And it's just a great movie. Yeah, so Planet of the Ace, for those who don't know, it's uh, directed by Franklin J. Schaffner and stars one of my favorite actors of all time. Don't know if he was the best guy behind the scenes, but Charlton Heston as the lead character, Taylor. And for those who don't know what Planet of the Apes is about, especially the original one, this is another case where the new movies, The Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn, and War all could have been on this list somewhere because those movies are incredible. But my favorite will always be the original 1968 classic. Now, for those who don't know, this follows Taylor as he lands on an unknown planet and quickly discovers that the planet is not run by aliens or humanoids, but apes, just straight up apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, you name it. They are on this planet and they have guns. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah awkward segue um yeah so he gets taken by them and discovers their society and how they test like they do animal testing but on humans uh they kill humans for sport they use humans as training dummies um the whole bit and spoiler alert the big reveal at the end it was earth all along you know the scene him in front of the statue of liberty half buried in the sand the symbol of freedom that scene alone is just incredible the symbol of freedom just in the sand and this man who is now a thousand years in the future on a destroyed earth well destroyed with apes running it just thinking how did this happen how did we we humans fall so far and besides that so charlton heston's performance amazing everyone in ape makeup the, the makeup in this movie is known for revolutionizing cross uh prosthetic use in movies um this is the first time we'd seen prosthetics used like this on such a grand scale like hundreds if not i don't want to say thousands hundreds of actors were wearing these prosthetics that allowed them to show emotion while in full ape makeup it was it really was incredible um i've watched this movie and the other ones well over 50 times um and they never get old, and especially this first one. The opening quarter of this movie, you don't even see the apes. It's all just suspense of them landing on this planet, then they don't know where they are. We don't know where they are. You see some like weird scarecrows, thunderstorms happening. And then the buildup to when the apes actually come, they're in a cornfield. You see sticks hitting the cornfield. You don't see the apes until eventually one of them finally gets seen and it's this big reveal. It is, if the movie wasn't called Planet of the Apes, that would have been the biggest cinematic reveal of all time. But it is called Planet of the Apes, so that is to be expected that there would be a Planet of Apes. But no, this movie, incredible. I don't think any movie's ever going to take the number one spot. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind came very close, but sadly... Well, I guess not sadly for me, but sadly for Eternal Sunshine, The Spotless Mind, on my 
well-regarded, oh, mwah, chef's kiss list of movies, it'll come in number two, and number one is Planet of the Apes from 1968. Now, that is my list, but remember, it's just my list. That is not the top 10 greatest movies to ever exist. It is the ones that I personally, in my opinion, are the top 10 best movies ever made for me. There's a lot of movies I haven't seen, and that's why I'm making my way through the top 100 IMDb list. But what I have discovered through that is that a lot of them I actually have seen, which is good. I feel like I'm well-versed. Um, but yeah, that's going to just about do it for me today. Um, if you have any suggestions for next week's episode or future episodes, any guests you want to have, any suggestions for the episodes themselves, feel free to hit me up on social media or comment on the YouTube um, video of this podcast. Um, so yeah, once again, Instagram Favalicious, Twitter at A underscore Fab 24. Yeah, feel free to talk about this show, talk about the next shows, talk about whatever you want. Talk about film with me. I love talking about films. Um, yeah, so that's going to just about do it. I'll see you next week. Don't really know what the next episode is going to be about, but I will update on my social media when I know. So I'm Anthony Fava, and this is as real as it gets, guys. Have a great day, no matter what day you're watching this. See you later.